Hey, it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast, and our goal and our mission is to empower and educate musicians and artists worldwide. And on today's episode, we sat down with Terrence Snake Hawkins, CEO of Marquee Records, discussing starting in the business with Mike Tyson, managing artists from Gucci, Trillville to Young Thug, and keeping his faith at the center. Hey, it's Sammy for another episode of the I Do Music Podcast, and I'm sitting down with Terrence Snake Hawkins. I'm going to give you your full your full government, even though it's pretty hard to find you. Yeah, I, um, I made it... Uh, um... I made a valid effort to make sure that I kind of stay. You know what I mean? I, I always told myself coming up, like, I, I wanted the money. I ain't really care for the fame. Right. You know what I mean? Like, it took me forever to get a Instagram. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know I, I mean? I, it's ATL Snake, though, for y'all yeah. that are wondering. And yeah. um, he's the CEO, president of Marquee Records, uh, Marquee Management, uh, the DOP agency. Um, the list goes on of who you're affiliated with and uh, the type of work that you're doing. But people would say that you have been an influence on many of our favorite artists, athletes, um, in terms of the management side, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I started um, <clears throat> in the management probably like when I was 24. And um, it came by way up sports. It was ironic, through boxing with Mike Tyson. Yeah, I saw that. That's yeah, interesting. What is? Yeah. How did that happen? Well, um, Back in like the in the late '90s, when you had boutique stores that carried brands like Aniche, mm -hmm. Mecca, Coogee, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. my cousin was friends with this couple from New York that owned the store called yeah. Runway Fashions. And back then, I was like really running hard in the in the street. So gotcha. he was like, "Yo, man, you need to slow up." My 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 partner, he got like his clothing store. He needs somebody he can trust to manage the store. This will give you a, a plan B, slow you up a little bit. And so um, I started managing the store, and I would bring, like, my homeboys that was, you know what I mean, like, Carlos, we know him as R.I.P. Shardy Lowe. Mm -hmm. I would, he would come shop with me, a couple mm -hmm. of my partners from the street. So athletes started coming. And then one time uh, Mike Tyson's um, business manager would come in the store, mm -hmm. and she would just shop, and she would, um, like, yo, I want to send a care, patch, care package to Mike. And I was like, cool. But she always liked the way I handled the business and the way I was hustling in the store. Mm -hmm. So she was like, yo, won't you come work for us? Won't you come work for Mike? He has a record company. And I'm like, I don't know nothing about record. record you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, I was cool with, like, sponsoring shows. And I would do, like, go to the club. And I would, you know what I mean? Just make You'd my... Around, I'd yeah. be around. I was cool with that. But I wasn't comfortable with saying I would work for a record company. Right. And, um... She would put me on the phone with him, you know what I mean? So I would talk to him. This is right when Mike got out of prison, a little while after he got out of prison. And um, she would just come in and say, like, I'll give you um, $40,000 a year, come work. I'm like, nah. I'm, I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm cool. I make my money here at the store. I'm a boss here. Mm -hmm. I leave here. I go to my hood. I make my money there. I'm cool. Mm -hmm. And um, she would just come in. I'd give you 50000 a year. And then one time she came in and, like, I give you sixty thousand a year, and I think um I had hired my my son's aunt to mm -hmm. work there. She was like, "Yo, you need to just you go know, ahead." And yeah, and I had at that point I had never been on a plane before. Oh wow! You know what I mean? Cause like I'm 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 Atlanta, East all, Atlanta, I heard, all the way I through. Heard. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I said, "Okay, I will try it." And next thing you know, um the next day they put me on the plane to New York. Wow! And um that's where I met with um. Jimmy and Mario Henchman. Actually, Jimmy was in prison at that time. So I talked to him on the phone. Oh, yeah. His brother was running the company. And then I left New York and went back to Atlanta. At that point, I had I had only my son at that point. He was like maybe uh, two, three years old. And I had just got legal custody of him, mm. full custody. So I had to work it out with my mom. She, him, My mom and my sister would, would help me mm. watch him. So... They put me on a plane from New York to Atlanta. Then Atlanta, I went to Vegas, and I sat with Mike, and that's wow. how it all began. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember that first flight since you hadn't been on a plane before? You yeah, I mean, it was flight? first class. Um, they picked me up. They, I land. They picked me up in a in a BMW. I mean, uh, Mercedes being a car service, but it was wow. a Mercedes, which was cool. I was used to nice cars, yeah. but not the service. Right. And then um, when I went to, to Vegas— I think at that time, BET was doing, like, their award show when they first started doing it. Oh, really? Out in Vegas, oh, out wow. of one of the hotels. And so Mike threw a party mm -hmm. 
um, because I had just got hired. And I mean, I didn't know nothing. I I remember what I had on. Like I had on like a, a, a three button Pelly Pell shirt, some jeans and some um, Jordans, right? And he threw this party and I didn't know how to really interact with yeah. people, right? Because walk through the door, you got Baby and Slim. At that point, cash money was on the come up, mm-hmm. on the rise. Um, Mike had this this piano in the foyer and uh Is that his house? It's at his house. It's oh, at his wow. crib on Tosumi. Right? This was he long sold his house, so I can say where it was. Where it was. Yeah. Um uh Jamie Foxx was playing the piano. Cisco <laughs> was singing. What? He had a basketball court and and, and Tigger probably not Tigger. Yeah, Tigger. This is when he first was doing Rap City. Mm-hmm. He probably don't remember this, but he was playing ball on the basketball court with Genuine. Mary J. Blige was there. And I remember going into the dining room area, where the kitchen area, where they had the little breakfast Mm -hmm. area to sit. Mm -hmm. And I sat down because it's like, I don't know how to, I don't know none of these people. They were all people I just seen or listened to their music or whatever. So Stevie Wonder sat down next to me. He was having a glass of Merlot. And I think I got so overwhelmed with the people that was in there. I just went up to my room and I just kind of watched TV, which is crazy because I was, an introvert when it came to that kind of interaction. interaction like, yeah. I didn't, like, come on, like, it, it was just a, 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 a luck that I end up in this situation. Mm-hmm. So I learned early on in what I try to tell people when they say, like, how do you get, when you first get into any kind of business that's going to be eventually on a bigger scale, you got to be a sponge. And I think at that point, I was just being a sponge. I didn't really know what to say, so I didn't say nothing. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't say the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. And so, um, like, that was, like, one of the big culture shocks when I got into the music business. I bet. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's a great way to start the story. Uh-huh. Um, so let me ask you this, because you mentioned uh, I like to just ask people, especially when they sit down with me, the their upbringing, and we kind of heard a little bit about your upbringing just in the short part of the introduction, but there's something that has to be in the water in East Atlanta because often you see such, like, different talent and, you know, even executives or whoever coming from East Atlanta, uh, from your, like, real street artist to, like, a Gucci to your more eccentric artist like a Childish Gambino. What do you think is so special? Because I'm from the west side slash south side of Atlanta, so we... typically have like a standard of the type of artists that come out of the our side of town like you don't really get a black or a childish gambino or i mean maybe out i guess you could say outcast or earth gang but it's something special i think about the east side of atlanta do you think that there's anything um, i think particular? i think if you if it, in my opinion when you talk about like the west side the west side in my opinion it probably would be a little smaller than when you consider the east side of Atlanta. That's true. That's you know I mean? true. Because when you say the east side, like I grew up in Decatur. Gotcha. Like when I, ever since I was known to be a human being and opened up my eyes, I was in Decatur on Glenwood Road. Okay. You know what I mean? So you got to think the east side starts, you could say it starts from Boulevard, which is my old neighborhood where I migrated to, Fourth Ward. Mm-hmm. From Boulevard all the way down to Latonia. Right, that's, that's true. the east side of Atlanta. That's true. So you got to go through, like what? Boulevard, you got to go through um, Candler Road, um, you know, Decatur, yeah. Clarkston, That's Tucker. True. So I think it, it's so many little boroughs yeah. and area that, you know, you don't know what you'll find. You know what I'm saying? That's true. That's true. So you have over 18 years in the business, maybe yeah. about that yeah, much, about right? Yeah, about that much, yeah. What do you think is the most valuable lesson you've learned? Um... Patience and controlling my passion. And I say that because in, in, in the beginning, I was always impatient. Mm. And I didn't have control of my passion. Like, it was times when I would manage artists, um, and I tell this story sometimes, um, Breon Prescott, who manages Jamie Foxx. Mm-hmm. I remember me and him bunted heads one time. And... Because I was managing an artist that was signed to his production company. Mm. At the end of the day, I'm still young in the business. I'm still learning. But no matter how I felt about what was going on, that was his artist. Right. So I had to learn to control my passion, right? Mm-hmm. I was only manage, managing him. At the end of the day, that's his artist. 
And sometimes in this business, you don't, you have to learn. The days of jumping on somebody's desk and threatening them are over. Right. Them days went out in the early 2000s. That, that, that's gone. I mean, you, 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 I go up to the building and now they call the police on you. Right. Then they just not deal with you, period. period. You can blackball yourself. So you got to learn to control your passion and then patience. When you're an entrepreneur and you're independent, your money don't come like a person that works for corporate and your paycheck comes every week or every two weeks. Mm -hmm. You got to realize you got to be patient. And being patient means that because it's not coming as fast as you want, don't do nothing stupid to fuck everything up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Which may be whether it's running a scam, whether it's rob, you know what I mean? Anything to... You just yeah. got to learn patience. So mm -hmm. patience and um and controlling my passion. That's great advice. Um, So currently you have a long list of artists and athletes that you represent, correct? Yeah. Um, My company, my management company, it... We specialize in the management aspect, the total all of, of, of artists, and the touring and road management of it. With Gucci, it's the touring and road management aspect of it. Um, with um, Q the Fool, it's the management part of it. With Hollywood YC, he's more so on the record end through my joint venture with Rock Nation, Universal hey, Musical. Yeah. Um, with the athlete side, it's more of the management part. So like Melvin Ingram, that that type of stuff. So with the management company, we do everything for the artist. You know what I'm saying? What Sir, does that entail? What, what, what purpose of a manager is to look out for the best interests of his client. Right. You know what I mean? In all his endeavors. You know what I'm saying? So as some some artists may only need the road and the touring part of the management, making sure that the dates are intact, that before he goes on the road, everything from the the vehicles to the travel mm -hmm. to what venue we going into to when you get there, everything that needs to be staging wise, production wise, all of that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? Um, um, and for us just managing the artist and actually hiring a road manager for that particular artist, for us like a cute fool or a Blackway or Band Hunter Izzy, mm -hmm. I would. Hey, this is what I think would be a good road manager for you. This is what I think would be a good tour manager for you. You know what I mean? Because the tour manager and road manager got to work hand in hand when it comes touring time. Mm -hmm. For as a Gucci, it's just road manager and touring because Gucci, I always tell people, Gucci is so self contained and he's been doing it so long, some things he just don't need. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Gucci man can manage himself. You know what I'm saying? And the only thing makes him comfortable is having somebody with him that he can trust on the road, touring, abroad, and domestic. Mm -hmm. And that's what I bring to the table for him, that comfortability to know that he got somebody he can count on that's going to make sure the business is handled while he's moving around. Right, right. So, I mean, how do you balance, though? Because, I mean, you started off with Mike Tyson in the beginning, just, you know, that kind of fell into, I would say, destined for your future. Um, to get your start in the business. But then, you know, as time went moved on and you proved maybe your work ethic and, like, what you're capable of doing, now you have a long list of people that you work with. So how do you balance that, and how are you adding on to your roster of clients? Well, um, the balance part, I could say, as far as balancing, I learned a lot from balancing from Tip when I worked with T.I. Mm -hmm. Tip would balance a lot of stuff from television to film to music to family. And I would watch that. Like that time I spent, I spent three seasons on family hustle, mm -hmm. but I would watch how he balanced that. And, and tip is very intelligent, very intelligent and very smart. Mm -hmm. And I was, I would watch how he balanced it. And I kind of took from that. You know what I mean? Another um, person, that I watch balance some, a lot of stuff would would be uh, Clay Evans. Who's that? Clay Evans. He is president of Grand Hustle Management. He manages Tip. Um, he manages Lil Duval. Mm -hmm. He has Rubicon brand. But Clay had been in the business. He go back to Bobby Brown. Oh wow! You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's like a brother to me. And I watch how he balanced with his kid and 
He would have open mic nights. He would still go out with Tip. In the early days, he still would go out with PSC. Um, he would be a brand ambassador for Great Goose. He would just do all these different things. Mm. And so how I learned how to balance things is just understanding that, number one, God is first. Then, you know, your family comes after that. And then your business. You know what I mean? And being that this all I've done for most of my life, I think the balance of the business comes easy to me for as artist to artist and project to project. The only problem that comes in is my personal time. Mm -hmm. Like I ain't been on a vacation for real since like 96. Wow. And that was to Cancun, Mexico. Right. Wow. Now I've been all around the world. Yeah. Brazil, Australia, Africa, um, Canada, Europe. I've been all around the world, but all those times I'm working, I'm on somebody else's time. Right. Cause I got to, I got to look out for somebody else or a group of people. So I never get the experience. I never get to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's the, 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 the conflict with me is like, I mean, I'm still figuring out how to balance my personal time. It's easy for people to say, well, you got to take time for yourself. And that's easy to say, but when other people are depending on you, like staff and your artists, it's kind of hard sometimes. Right, so right. I do have a conflict with balancing my personal with my business. Yeah, I mean, I also think that you've set out quite the foundation that you can, you know, maybe in 2019 yeah. carve, out, <laughs> carve out a little week or something for yourself. But I respect that. I think that, you know, you put in all that work so that you can relax later. So yeah, I'm yeah. hoping that you get that time for yeah, yourself. Yeah, I definitely got to put in that you time. You got to. You got to. I mean, and I read something the other day that, you know, just as much as you schedule time for your work, you schedule time for vacation. So yeah. um, definitely. Uh, so let me ask you this, too, because I think it's interesting that you went from athlete to, like, artist, um, working with, like, a tip to Gucci to, you know, everyone else. Um, but then you also still work with the athletes. Is there... A, difference the way you approach working with artists than athletes because i mean it is two different industries but it's very similar in terms of entertainment yeah i do because athletes have agents right right I, people always say why you never became an agent right well i always had an aau basketball team from because my son played ball okay. and my nephews played ball and so um like my nephew he plays for the Celtics now, Jalen Brown. Oh, that's your so, nephew. Yeah, I was so. going to ask him, like, is he one of, I, I love Jalen Brown. Is he somebody you work with or, okay. That, that's sense. that's my nephew. Gotcha. I always say, like, he's not a client of mine. He's he, That's my family. family. Mm -hmm. So whatever he needs from me, I'm going to do. And it's not about money issue. Really, with any of my clients, it ain't so much about the money. I got to have a passion anyway. Right. But I had an AAU basketball program um, in which it became a grassroots Adidas program at the latter part of, when they became like 15, 16, 17 you. So in order for me to coach the team, I couldn't become an agent because it's the NCAA conflict of interest right, and it's right. a violation. So with athletes, you have agents, right? And with agents, they act sort of like management. Like management. Mm -hmm. Only difference is the role in, of a manager with athletes, you're like the the buffer. I mean and you can be the buffer between the agent and the athlete, mm -hmm. the a the athlete and the family. You know what I mean? The a the athlete and different brand opportunities you can bring. That manager is what gonna do what the agent can't do because he's gonna do more of the legal stuff, yeah, yeah. contractual stuff. He ain't gonna really be worrying about who the tickets gotta go to. You know what I mean? He may bring brand opportunity to the table, but that manager gonna go out and seek those brand opportunities. Right, right. But um. The athletes, I'm mean, I just I'm just in love with sports. So a lot of the athletes wanna be artists. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the biggest thing with, art, with athletes being artists, sometimes the consumer don't take them seriously. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's definitely um intriguing to me to figure out how to get the consumer to take them seriously. Cause some athletes can really rap, can right. really sing. Right, right, right. So um with the athletes, it's more so on the musical side with their passion. You know what I mean? And for to manage the athlete is honestly is a lot a lot less stressful than managing uh, artists that are coming out the street because uh, most athletes, I mean, they multi-millionaires, so they ain't pressing you about, I need a check, I need money, I got to pay bills. They so, focused, yeah. They focus, yeah. So how does it feel when your clients reach, I, I actually thought that you worked with Jalen Brown, so it kind of throws a line of question off a little bit, but 
regardless, that's that's family, so it probably even feels even better, him making it to the finals and everything. How does it feel when your clients, though, reach, like, a pivotal moment in their career or, like, a successful moment in their career? Well, with, with Jalen, and we joke about this all the time, I always say, I remember when I used to take you to get Zaxby chicken boxes <laughs> after practice, right? Mm -hmm. I remember when, after games, I have to wait with you on the court before we go in the locker room because fans want autographs and really? people come with a lot of like basketballs wanting to sign. I was like, yo, he can't sign. I mean, that that was a fun part, like, right? And I never forget the day he, he I remember when he entered the draft and the day, you know, he decided to enter the draft, he called me. And at this particular time, I was working with Young Thug. Um, me and Thug, we was touring, we was overseas. And he called me, he's like, yo, Unc, what you doing? I said, I ain't doing that. He said, what you doing June such and such? I said, um, I don't know right now. Um, I said, I might be with Thug and Blase Blase. So he said, I want you to come to the draft with me. That kind of got me emotional because I never asked anything from him. You know what I mean? I, any of them, him, my son, I just want y'all to go to college, make some of yourself. If you go to the NBA, that's just a blessing. So, when he asked me to come, that touched me. And then I couldn't make it because Thug and I was in Paris at the time. And the moment that it really hit me is when I was able to go to the first game. Mm -hmm. So Gucci is a fan of Jalen's. Mm -hmm. So, and Jalen's a fan of Gucci. <laughs> so he's like, yo, um, can you come to, um, y'all going to be in, on tour? Because me and Gucci was on tour with the weekend. Mm -hmm. So we happened to go to Boston. So he says, um, man, can you bring Gucci by? I said, I'll, I'll bring him by, no problem. So we got floor seats to the game, but he wanted me to come in early. Jalen, he wanted me to go to the facility. And so I went to the Celtics facility. I met Danny Ainge. I met the staff. That's and dope. um this Catherine, who is in charge of like the tickets and dealing with the family, she said, We kept hearing about his uncle Snake, and we didn't know what to expect. <laughs> and so when I got to the facility, they got to know me, they was like, so Catherine was like, she was pregnant at the time. She was like, I'm going to name my kid Snake. you like the best, right? So just walking through the facility, but when it really hit me is the day of the game. And I got a picture on my Instagram of us walking through the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And they take the pictures. Mm -hmm. And we was walking through for him to go to the locker room to get dressed. And I got really fucked up then because I'm like, yo, man, like. This is real. This is real, like. I remember he was this long-legged, high-waisted eighth grader. <laughs> you know what I mean? That even as a freshman, the coach really didn't give him an opportunity. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And to see this now, that was really moving for me. Yeah. And for him to every move that he make, he always called me, asked me my opinion. It's like, here, I was on the way here. He's doing a commercial for Champs and Adidas. Mm -hmm. So he calls me out of the blue because he was in Indonesia doing something for NBA abroad. Mm. And he calls me out of the blue this morning on the way here. He's like, Uncle, what you doing? I said, well, I'm going to do this podcast. I never did an interview. I'm going to do this part. Um, You got to come to this. I got to do a commercial. You got to pull up. <laughs> I'm like, JB. Like, So I said, when I finish, I'll be on the way. Yeah. So that that's like, that kind of stuff is like for Real to way. see the, the beginning to now mm -hmm. is, is dope. That is dope. That's awesome. He he's doing really great things. Um, you you mentioned that you were on tour with Thug at the time, which is why you couldn't make the draft. Uh, but you toured a lot around the world with yeah. with your artists and uh, with people you worked with. Could you share one of like the greatest memories on tour, like the best crowd? Because I can imagine that it changes from city to city. Of course, an Atlanta show might be. I don't know. I Without don't know a doubt, it, it comes. It comes. When it comes to touring, it comes Young Thug and then Gucci. I had never been to Europe until I got with Thug. Mm -hmm. I never forget Amina. I always knew Thug just in passing, but Amina had a tour manager that like flaked out on her at the last minute. Dang. So Clay called me like, "Yo, Amina's trying to reach you. She needs somebody to go out with Thug." I said, cool. I didn't, like, handcuff her and be like, yo, you got to pay me X amount of dollars. Right. I'm like, I fuck with the, I like the movement. When I went overseas with the, what I seen when that dude hit the stage was something that I ain't never seen in the States. 
it was unbelievable the energy and he was excellent at playing to the emotions of the crowd you know what I mean mm-hmm. he know when to take them up and when to take them down and when they finished that show when them people left that show they they was exhausted and it was non-stop yeah you know what I mean mm-hmm. and Thug played it all the way to the T and then the second would be with Gucci because when Gucci got released, when we went overseas, and all this is overseas because mm-hmm. the crowds, you know what I mean? They it was appreciate massive. it differently. They appreciate too. it way differently. Mm-hmm. And when Gucci hit that stage and you see the aura of this dude and you see these people with Trap God T-shirts. Mm-hmm. And mind you now, Thug was keeping that, that goo-op because Thug would do goo-op, the record goo-op, Again, every show. And he would always say, one, two, three, goo up in the whole crowd. Goo up. So you would see, and when they when I finally went back to those same places and I saw that, yeah. Unbelievable. That's it's crazy. Dope. That's dope. So let me ask you this. What does it mean to be a CEO? You talked about how early on when you worked at the store, you liked it because you were a boss, you were a manager there. Um, and you know, and then moving forward, now you're the CEO, the president of your own company. Um, you continue to keep that like boss mentality. What does it mean to be a CEO? Well, honestly, CEO don't mean shit if it ain't no no production. Mm-hmm. See, any motherfucker can go and create a company and say I'm the CEO, mm-hmm. and then sell people on what they do. But if you don't see any product productivity, and you don't see other people inspired and moving in your situation, you ain't you're not a CD, CEO. What made me feel like more of a CEO with the latest ventures that I've done in my career in the last year and a half. But I always felt like I was a boss because I was always controlling my destiny along with with the help of Allah, with God. Right. I always knew that I wanted to be in control of, of what I wanted to do. Right. You know what I mean? And I just wanted to do it the right way. I didn't want to really... Like, I always had the, the, this this thing with me. I'm not going to take from no motherfucker. Now, if I feel like you owe it to me and you don't want to give it to me, I'm going to figure out a way to get it from you. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But I don't want to build my brand or my business on robbing an a, a artist, an athlete. Now, I don't want to build like that. It's it's opportunities I probably could have had been had more than I have now or been ahead of the game. I just chose not to do it that way. Mm-hmm. That just was my choice. In turn, I earned a lot of respect from a lot of important people. Mm-hmm. So the the things I've done in the last year, year and a half, in my heart solidified me as a real CEO. And I still got a long way to go. It's because I got like a plan mm-hmm. that I want to, how I want to do it. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? But I mean, it, to, to say you're a CEO, I mean, that's just like a father. Anybody can say, well, I'm a dad or whatever, but it's a lot that comes with being a father. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's the same kind of, you know what I mean, analogy, same kind of scenario. So how have you managed to get this joint deal with Rock Nation and Universal Music Group? Uh, what does that mean, and why is it beneficial for you and your client? Well, I, I signed this um, this kid, cute fool, out of the DMV. Mm-hmm. Um, I met him one time. Gucci, we was doing a, a show, and he, he was a support. And um, he was like rocking this crowd, right? Like, I'm like, what the fuck is it? But he wanted to meet me. Um, the kid is Muslim. I'm Muslim. Yeah. So that was a connection. Um, I'm like, yo, he dope. And he wanted to work with me. Mm-hmm. We had mutual respect for each other. So every label in the country was after this kid. I, I went and sat down and I talked with everybody because I said, you got to open up yourself and take every meeting. Never sell yourself short. Mm-hmm. I always take care of me. So with Rock Nation, I had a connection with Rock Nation through Emory Jones. Okay. Right? So when Emory got out of prison, I met him like a couple of weeks out of prison. Like he he hadn't really started doing nothing in the business world yet. And I was just still on the come up and trying to find my way as well. Mm-hmm. So we connected and Emory said, man, yo, I fuck with you. I want to I want to do some work with you. I promise when I get get it together, I'm gonna fuck with you. Right. So so happened. Orlando Orlando McGee 
who used to be at BME with Lil John, mm-hmm. I used to manage Trillville, and that's how I met Orlando. He became, and Orlando used to manage Future. He he was the start, you know what I mean, after Future, I think he left Rocco, and then Orlando came in the mm-hmm. mix, or it might have been doing Vice the same, person, yeah. whatever, but but um, he had became the president of A&R at Rock Nation. Right. So through my attorney, Orlando reached out to my attorney, he's like, yo, I'm just interested in this kid, Q the Fool. I said, cool, Orlando's my guy. I want to sit down and talk with him. So we go to New York, and we sit in the conference room, and they had to find out I was affiliated or cool with Emory Jones. So Emory now is this big, he, he's like damn near going on mogul status now. Mm-hmm. Emory, like, he has Puma. He's doing deals with New Balance. He he got the paper plane shit with Rock Nation. He's Jay's right-hand man, best friend. So Emory comes from upstairs. So Emory says, yo, we're going to do this kid's deal. Then we're going to do Snake's deal. So I'm like, get the fuck out of here, man. Like, <laughs> Emory, come on. Like, I, I'm still moving around. Yeah. So I do the deal with Q the Fool at Rock Nation because that's what Q wanted to do after visiting with multiple record labels. And Rock Nation is more of a independent major. Right. It's more of a boutique label. Mm-hmm. So later in the studio, me and Orlando was talking, like, yo, why you why you don't have a, a want to do a, like a label deal? Or, I said, well, I never thought about doing a label deal for my company. I stuck with the management because I never had the capital that I wanted to gamble with. Right. And people don't understand the music business. I don't care how much money you got, how much money that you want to invest in the music game. It's a gamble. It's like going to Vegas. You may hit, you may not. Some people put a little in and they pop. Some people put a bunch in and they pop and vice versa. You might put all this money in and it might not do nothing. nothing yeah. And I never had the capital that I wanted to risk to do that shit because I love my lifestyle. I, I like to eat what I want to eat. I like that if my kids want to buy something and they call me for it, it's done. If I want to go in Magic City and fuck up some money, I, I got that privilege. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I said, I never wanted to do that. So Orlando said, yo, let me worry about that. You know what I mean? Because what you're doing, I love what you do. And I like your mindset. And you got a lot of talent around you. And you connected to a lot of talent. Right. So Emery says to me, and I, I was like, well, you know, Emery's like, fuck a job. I don't, we ain't giving you no job here. We need to talk partnership. Right. So I end up meeting with Tata. You got to think. You got, I think it's Tata, Emery, Jay-Z. Like, that comes yeah, from, is. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I go sit down and meet with Tata. And we was talking about diversity in the music business as far as more minorities mm-hmm. and executive positions. And uh, when I left that meeting with Tata, he was like, yo, man, the conversation that we had was refreshing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then Benny Pugh, who's the president of Rock Nation, I had dealt with him when he was working with L.A., and he had a presidency over at Epic. Mm-hmm. And I had two artists at Epic. I had um, Lotto Savage, and I had this kid named Slice Nine. Mm-hmm. So Benny vouched for me, Orlando McGee. It was his idea, along with Emory Jones, to put it together. And when I left Tata's office... Next thing you know, my attorney had the paperwork for a joint venture profit sharing deal wow. with Rock Nation, Universal Music Group. So in that turn, now my juices start flowing. This just happened in a matter of like the last few months. Oh wow. It, we started it talking about it back in February. Okay. And it just came into fruition. Well, congrats to that. Yeah, so I thought this been, was like an ongoing because of the relationship that you had with them, but it was yeah, you finally said I all finally right. said, Yeah, because I was like uh, nervous, similar like doing podcasts and shit like that. Like you don't know what I, I'm I, like I don't want to fail, right? Mm-hmm. So, but with this situation, I feel like I got a lot of support. And in turn, now I have other labels that reach out to me, like, yo, we want to kind of do the same thing with you, what you're doing with Rock okay. Nation. But you know, I, I feel like um Orlando McGee and Benny Pugh and Ty Ty and Emory Jones and um, um, just talking with them gave me the confidence and I already have confidence in myself. It's just like I just want to put out a good product. So now I'm able to sign artists um, that I feel like and I want to I do things that's going to be a little different. Like I don't have to go after the giant. 
I want to find that diamond in the rough. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I want to take him and make him right. a star. That's what's up. I I was going to ask, too, like, because you talked about, like, some of the artists that you worked with. What is it for you personally as a management, um, as a company, when you're, you realize that you've done all you can for an artist or the relationship is pretty much like, you know, I've done what I could, I could with this potential business uh, relationship and now I need to move forward or we need to move forward. Like, how do you have that conversation and when do you know it's time to do that? Um, I guess. Well, when I start to outwork the artist, I know there's time for me to part ways with them. I should never be able to outwork the artist. Whether you got, whether the artist has vices such as fucking with pills and all that shit that you can't be, if you can be a functional addict, that's your preference. Be a functional addict. But when you become a non-functional addict, I got to let you go. And I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you get to the point where you feel like you know it all Mm -hmm. and you can, and you're the reason why you're here and not because of your team, then I'll let you go. Mm -hmm. There's no problem. And I don't have no problem doing it. It's very easy for me. Mm -hmm. I always say... I don't mind having hard conversations about money. You know what I mean? Yeah, because a lot of people don't like to have those conversations. I love them. (laughs) I love them. So how do you think the business has changed? I mean, you talked about how you can't go into a room and just, like, jump on top of the the desk or the table anymore. Um, But since you've begun, like, has it been easy or difficult for you to adapt to these changes? I mean, in social media, technology, streaming, like, all of It's much easier. Um... Especially with streaming and social media, because you can get the product out to the consumer fast, mm-hmm. right? Um, and then partnerships, working. I always say it's power in numbers. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, I can work with Coach K and P, like them my homeboys, and me and Amina are like hand in hand. Right. And you can make you can do more together working together than against each other. Right. People always wonder, and they say, well. Man, this is not like this area ain't like Atlanta. Um, how do y'all do it? Partly because most of the time in Atlanta, if we beefing with each other, sooner or later we just fix it. Because to go to war costs money. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Whether you're in the street and you gotta hire pay pay somebody to do dirt, or whether you gotta hire lawyers, where you gotta pay bonds. Like, it just, to go to war, it just costs money. So if it ain't got nothing to do with nothing that's dire, like nobody didn't put their hands on on their child or put a pistol and rob you to your face or, like, out of, you know what I mean, out of the blue. Like, if it ain't dire, it could be worked out. And even in dire situations, you got to figure out to work it out because people wonder why countries don't go to war. Mm-hmm. So, so so quickly, often, yeah. yeah, because it, it it's casualties, mm-hmm. and it costs so. Um, with the streaming, you know what I mean. The money that's generated it br- is bringing the music business back into fruition and, and more vibrant again. Social media, you can get the product and you can market it to the consumer quicker, and people developing partnerships, right? M- merging together, you know what I mean, and and doing deals together. Um, I love the way that that change is. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. for so long, you got to think, especially with executive positions, it kind of went to the same people all the time. Right. You know what I mean? You may see Leo Coins here, but he may go to this label. You may see L.A. here, but he go to this label. They kind of just go, go around, around. You know what yeah. I mean? But now with production companies and independent record labels doing partnerships, now we becoming executives and influencers. Now we have a real voice in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the way, you know what I mean, the business is turning. Yeah. How would you, uh, or let me ask this, actually. How would people describe Snake, like, in terms of your work ethic? How do you think people view you in terms of the business? Obviously, you have these, like, longstanding relationships with people like Orlando McGee. I meant to tell you, we talked talk to him, too. Oh, um, of course, Amina and, like, so on and so forth. A lot of the people you probably worked with who we would consider pivotal people in this this space. So um, obviously they enjoy working with you or they don't mind working with you because they know you do something. So what would you say, how would they describe Snake? Um, um, a friend of mine, Naeem McNair, 
who's a, a, a executive over Interscope, high executive at Interscope. He called me. I was in L.A. about three weeks ago. So he just out of the blue, like, yo, come out. Won't you come out of the office? And I've been, I've met with, like, I've done deals with him before. Like, I did the Blackway deal with him to Universal Republic. And he left and he went to Interscope. So now he kind of got, like, this Universal situation. Mm -hmm. um, so he takes me throughout the building. So I go meet John Jennick, which is a CEO at Interscope now. And I'm just having this conversation. I didn't expect to meet John. Then I go meet the general manager. Then I go see Joey I.E. And I mean, I, I knew some of these people before, but, like, he's taking me from top to bottom. And one thing he kept saying, like, what he told John Jennick is, like, yo, it's a snake. You know, you tell my government, this is Terrence Hawkins and a snake. <laughs> and then, of course, they get it. How you get, become snake? And uh, But um, he said he has a really, snake has a really good feel for artists, he has a, a really good stronghold um, in solving problems with artists. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he's made it his business to always stay neutral. And that's a big part of it. I'm not perfect. Of course. I, I learn things every day, and I learn from my mistakes. But when I'm loyal, sometimes I can be loyal to a fault, but... I think loyalty is a lost art in this business. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because so much is driven by money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To where loyalty get lost. Because sometimes you can put your loyalty in an artist, and an artist will break your heart. Mm -hmm. You can put your loyalty in a building, and you'll get fired. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so my loyalty to people at times, it got me in trouble because it's sometimes I stay involved a little too long. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So loyalty, understanding how to maneuver through hard situations and having a good feel for artists and the product would be what I would That's say. Yeah, those are great things. Why, why, why would you say your reputation um, is key in building upon those, that business and those relationships in the business? Um, because for somebody like, uh, forgive me, I don't know who he said from Interscope. Um, Naeem McNair. Naeem. If someone would say, you know, if he were to go in and say like, yeah, you need to take this meeting with so-and-so or come into the office, like that's showing that you have a great reputation with him and so on and so forth. The people that you work with, Amina, trying to get in touch with you about touring uh, with Thug and et cetera. Why is that your, why is your reputation and not just your reputation, but reputation in general, an important thing for those who are interested in getting this business. Because it, your reputation is essentially your brand. Same thing. Right. And it's no different from any brand. Like if you go in a grocery store. I mean, I like to get the honey wheat Sara Lee bread. I mean, I like it. It's a <laughs> great brand. I don't too much like Wonder Bread. Yeah, right. You know I mean, I mean it's, the quality ain't... It's not Sara Lee. It ain't Sara Lee. So it's about... It's, that's the the analogy, right? Mm -hmm. I want to have a, a good brand, and I want to ha have some substance to me and quality, and you got to have that. Right. You know what I mean? Of course you're going to make mistakes along the way, but even along the way, your intentions, people see your intentions. Right. Just like God knows our intentions, mm -hmm. people can see your intentions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I've been in some situations well, my intentions ain't all the way been good because of the person that I'm dealing with. I felt like his intentions won that way as well. Mm -hmm. But as you learn and you grow, you understand that you got to keep good intentions. You got to try to be as honest as possible because people see through that. Mm -hmm. And if you go in with bad intentions, a hidden agenda, people so see through that and they tend not to want to deal with you because for a person like Naeem Ali, Naeem McNair to say, hey, I want you to meet John Jennick. He don't want to bring nobody to meet this guy mm -hmm. that he feel that can hurt his relationship with him. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because it's all built on relationships. Mm -hmm. So um, where did the name Snake come from? Because, I mean, obviously, like a lot of times when you hear the name Snake, 
you don't think positive things all the time. You think of a snake, you know, yeah. what, what people call it. So where where did the name come from? Well, growing up, I never was all that connected to my family. Mm-hmm. My mom, my sister, though, like, like that's my heart. Uh, my grandparents, before they passed away on my mom's side. And though I have some affiliation with my dad's side of the family, he never really took me around this side. Mm-hmm. So when you grow up like that, people that you meet in the street become like your family. Right. You know what I mean? That's why you in the South, we got a lot of cousins a and lot uncles. Of cousins. And un- <laughs> because a lot of times the family dynamic is disconnected. So the people that you meet and you with every day in your neighborhood mm-hmm. be like a brother to you. Mm-hmm. So when I was living in Decatur, I would move around, move around a lot as a kid. But I went to Lothonia High School, and because, like, my dad, he was on cocaine, crack cocaine all my life, all that I, that I can remember just being on this earth mm-hmm. myself. And part of the reason why we moved around because he hurt the family dynamic. So I would just move, move, move. And finally, when I got to Lothonia, I didn't, I ended up, didn't live in, moved out of the district back to Decatur, but I didn't want to, to leave, leave the school. Right, right. So my homeboy, his name is Justin Harris. He's my partner to this day, my brother, everything. So we like we were like cousins, and his nickname was Jep. Now, he had eight brothers and sisters, and they lived in this house. They lived, they didn't have a whole bunch, but his dad was a hardworking man, did asphalt work. His mom took care of the household, and Jet was like my protector in school. He was always athletic. Um, we became best friends, and we always had each other back. But he knew what I was going through at home, and so I would go spend the night at his crib. And I said, like, like they didn't have much, you know what I'm saying? Like I ain't have shit. Right. But they had a, like a family dynamic. And though him and his brothers they would fight, and his mama would cuss everybody out sometimes. You know what I mean? I like that dynamic. Mm-hmm. So she, everybody had nicknames. His name was Jep. His brother, um, John, his name was Dog. His <laughs> other brother was named Cat. And um, his younger brother, we call him Pup. He had a sister named Ruby. Like, everybody had, had nicknames. A nickname. So his mom would always call me a corch whip. And they from the Deep South. Okay. His, his, his parents are from the Deep South. Gotcha. And so... I was like, she would always say, you look like a little black corch whip because I was always skinny, yeah. right? And tall and long. So I was like, okay, as long as you let me stay here and I ain't got to go home to where my <laughs> daddy raising hell and fucking up everything, you call me whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And one day I asked her, I'm like, what's a corch whip? And she said, it's this little black snake that used to be in the bushes oh, in the, true, true, where true. they lived at. So we're in the, in the, in the, in the neighborhood one day playing basketball and Jep ended up calling me a corch whip. And the kids in the neighborhood was like, what's what's a corch whip? It's a snake. snake. <laughs> and they just kept calling me snake. That's ever since crazy. Then. That's a great story. Yeah. Shout out to Jep. Yeah, Shout out yeah. to the family. Straight that's up. it. That's r- some real Southern Straight shit. Straight up. <laughs> Girl, that's some Southern shit for you. Right? <laughs> that's like collard greens and vinegar and hot sauce. Listen. Right? I'm here for it. Uh, so I have an aunt or She's really like cousin, but basically she's older, so I call her aunt. But she made a nickname for everybody, exactly. and they were really embarrassing. So exactly. sometimes, like my late uncle, actually, his nickname, I, it would be so hard to tell my family, like or my friends who would come around, like, yeah, this is my uncle, but my aunt. You got to explain the whole story, so exactly. I, I connect very well with that. Exactly. So let me ask you, what do you strive for um, when you're doing this? Because Obviously, you know, you talk of you want to make money, you want to live, you want to live a certain life, but it's more than that, um, especially when it comes to management, because it's very selfless to take on somebody else's like life and their business. So what is it that you strive for when you're doing these things? Consistency. Being independent is so much inconsistency in this. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Mm-hmm. But the mortgage got to be paid or the rent got to be paid. Your car note, kids daycare or lunch money, whatever. It can. Without consistency, it's hard. You know what I mean? What separates an independent from a corporation is they have consistency. A lot of times that's because corporations, whether the consumer know it, know it or not, 
always partner up with us. That's why you hear on Bloomberg television. I look at Bloomberg. Yeah. Like T-Mobile is trying to merge with Sprint. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And this merge with because it's power in numbers and you can create consistency. Right. That's what I strive to try to do, to bring consistent revenue, create consistent good product, mm-hmm. be around consistently great people, consistency. I think once I I get the consistency down pat, I can relax and I can take a break because at that point, Revenue should be cool. It should be the staff back. should be moving the way it should be. You know what I mean? I can at least sit back, but when there's no consistency, you you always trying to stay ahead. Exactly. So uh, you mentioned your faith a lot throughout this, um, and I actually was on your Instagram before the podcast, and I was. How do you like my Instagram? Because it's very, it's very good? lavish life. You live a very but, nice but life. But is it? I, I want to look at it like art, right? Like when yeah, I, no, I was I like it. shying away from social media, right? Yeah. So my my homeboy is like my big my big homie, Whack One Hundred. Mm-hmm. He he now manages game, yeah. and I was a part of game's career in the very beginning. Oh really? Yeah. So um, um, Whack would tell me like, "Yo, you need to get an Instagram." Man, I make so much money just just on my Instagram, and so he the one came up with ATL Snake, and that's how I got it. So that's how you yeah. So like I take started. pride in like I like it. Want to have great like quality captions and motivating content. You know what I mean? I like it. I think you're doing a great job. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and that. you don't post a lot of yourself. Like you post yeah. just things that you know it it makes sense. Now that I met yeah. you, what your Instagram is like. So I think that your Instagram should be a reflection of what you like and what you do. So. I like it. Thank you. But one of the best posts that I saw was mm-hmm. you sat down with uh, Minister Farrakhan. Yeah. Uh, at some point, I don't yep. know exactly yep. what it was, and he seems to be a pretty big. I mean, obviously, if you're Muslim and you know he's a, a key figure, not just to that community, but or your community, but to all of us, um, just being like a leader um, and very. A lot of times, the people I know that have had conversations with him or been in his presence, you know, they feel that. So how was that conversation for you? How did that um, even happen? Well, it happened through his son. I'm really good friends with his son, Mustafa Farrakhan, mm-hmm. which is the head of his security team. Mm-hmm. Um, been with him, like, ever since he was old enough to be around. Um, I'm an Orthodox Muslim. Um, what does that mean? Well, some people will say they will be, like, a Sunni or a Shiite. Gotcha, some people gotcha. follow initially Islam. If I was anything, I would be more of a Sunni. Sunni meaning um, the way of the Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salam. Um, I love the teachings of of the nation of Islam because you got to understand it was created back in the days when black people were oppressed. Mm -hmm. So they needed that camaraderie. And to this day, they still need it. Absolutely. But Mustafa, um, I had developed a relationship with him because... I was connecting Tip and the Honorable Minister Farrakhan together. And I never forget, um, I was, Tip surprised me one day. He was like, yo, I, I was trying to put that situation together. So he's like, yo, come with me. We, f- we finna go meet the minister. This was some, few, some years ago. So we went up to his suite. He was staying downtown. I won't say where, but he was staying downtown. And, um, just to enter the area where he was staying, you had brothers on every corner mm-hmm. for like a couple blocks. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had always stayed, like I, I don't listen to every speech that Minister Farrakhan probably ever did because it was enlightened for me as a as a black man and as a person that's trying to make it out here, right? right. So we go inside the hotel and the aura around his brothers at the elevators, his brothers at every floor. Right. It's the aura was around, and so when I go into his suite, out of all, like it was three of us, me, Tip, and another one of our, our partners that that was with him a lot during that time. When I met him, it was more emotional for me because I had not too long ago took my shahada which is no is in the same comparison for a Christian who gets baptized. baptized you know, right. you can go to church all you want as a kid, but they say until you get baptized, now you're a Christian. Right. So as a Muslim, I studied Islam for a long time, and I was always intrigued of the religion. 
But I had just took my Shahada in 07. So shortly after that, now I get to meet um, Mr. Farrakhan. So when I walk into this room, his aura, it was very emotional for me. Mm -hmm. Because as a Muslim, and I've been watching this man, and, and you see how his thought process grew and how he he works with other faiths. Because in Islam, we respect, you know what I mean? Like, we we love Christianity and we love, you, you work together. And it's like, you know, with religion, people make it bad. Exactly. You know what I mean? Because it's like one thing you don't talk about in the crowd of room is politics and religion. Because mm -hmm. you'll never win the argument. Because mm -hmm. everybody going to feel like they're right. Right. So when we, I walked into that room and we sat down and ate dinner, just some of the things that he talked about, and the religion is already disciplined, mm -hmm. but his aura and is um, mythical, it's like magical, you know what I mean? And his love for black people and people in general, um, that was one of the best experience i mean besides my two kids being born like that that was one of the best experience of my life especially especially in, in my religion you know absolutely what I'm so how do you think that you know just even not just that experience but just being grounded in your faith and um and like your beliefs has helped you professionally and like with the relationships you've built over time or just like you know you said you started working with cutiful because y'all already kind of had an understanding in your faith. Well, it helped me. It helps artists like a cute fool because he's young. He just turned 21. And he still oh, makes mistakes. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he listens to me because of the magnetic attraction of the dean, which is the religion. Mm -hmm. But he know what I'm telling him. I mean it from my heart. I, I don't drink. I don't smoke. That don't make me better than nobody else because I got other vices. I tell people all the time, I got other, other vices. You know what I mean? I lust for money. I lust for other things. And I don't need to compound that with alcohol and drugs or I'd be out of control. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect, right? When times that I'm stressed, I can go into the masjid, which is the mosque. And that's one thing that I love about Islam the mosque stay open from sun up to sundown. It ain't locked up throughout the day, and then somebody got the deacon got to open it up or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's open, so when I'm feeling stressed, I can go into a mosque anywhere in the world, and I can just pray. Or I can just be to myself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can just sit back and focus on some mistakes that I may have made, things that I know I need to change, mm -hmm. and I can just be quiet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can pray. And the aspect of trying to make your five prayers a day and keeping the pillars of Islam in your heart. And, you know, because we live in the world. And I don't care what religion that you follow, the world can sidetrack you because every day it's a hustle and bustle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Islam, the discipline of it, helps me deal with a lot of things that growing up I probably couldn't have dealt with. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So um, another thing that I wanted to touch on was like the balance that you said you may not uh, have for yourself to give yourself personal time, but you also have your two children um, and then you're just family in general that, you know, you look out for your nephew, your, your sister, your mom, um, and so on and so forth. How has it been for you raising a family? I mean, you said early on in your career, your child was like two, three. That's like super yeah, early Yeah, I, I got um, legal custody of my son when he was 11 months old. Wow. And then when I got into the music business and traveling, my mom and my sister were my support system. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter came later. My son just graduated from high school. Um, he's on his way to Huntington Prep. He played basketball. Mm -hmm. And hopefully he'll leave there and go to college college and, and play. I just want him to get a college education for free. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but I've always made time for them. Even when I coached, I would leave. If I'm in L.A., I would leave. Like, I may fly from L.A. to Dallas, coach the game, because my son was on the team, leave Dallas, go back to L.A., and try to make it back for the championship game. 
You know what I mean? I would leave yeah. wherever I'm at, make sure I'm there for the two practices out the week, then I go again. Mm-hmm. When it was time for things with Khalil and and in school, I would always dogs point, I would make sure that I would do those things. Yeah. I was blessed that my daughter's mom, she was always, you know what I mean, that's what she was always great, a great parent. Mm-hmm. Um and and being in tune with with what my daughter needed, you yeah. know what I mean. But you no, know, it's, it's like as a Muslim, the girl, the mom deal with the girl. You mm-hmm. know what I mean. Like I, I think I may have gave my daughter a bath maybe one time when she was a baby, mm-hmm. because that's she's a female. That's for the mom. It's for the male to make sure that the males are what they need to be. Mm-hmm. But um, I've always made sure that I was there for them. If my daughter say, "Hey, Dad, I, I want to go shopping," I'm a, I won't care where I'm at. I'm a fly there. If she got a recital wherever I'm at, I'm flying. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, I make sure that she understands that her dad loves her, and I spoil her to the to the effect to where when she gets older, any man she meet, it's a standard. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That's important. So That's I, important. I've always gonna make time to for them. You know what I mean? But for myself is where I have a conflict. Absolutely. That's what's up. I, I wanted to ask you, too, because when I was looking at your Instagram, which is literally the only information that is on the Internet, by the yeah. way. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about, the, you know, how we were talking off the record of how you were kind of skeptical. Not skeptical, but you didn't really necessarily want to do a podcast. You're like, you strayed away from or shied away from doing interviews and things like that and put the focus on your client. Um, but For one, because I think... I think first of all, you can never, you should never want to be bigger than, than your client, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like that has to come organically. Exactly. You can't strive to be that. Mm-hmm. No, it just ain't gonna work. When you see people like a P, QCP or Coach P, nobody knew who P was. It organically came for him to where no, he really. gained some fame. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He didn't so- seek that in the beginning. It organic came. It is cool when it's organic. Um, I just never like the aspect that people can say shit and then they hide behind comments and shit. Like I just never, I never like. It, it, no, I mean it, it just ain't my thing. And then too, it, it's like people hate for your success. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It wasn't honestly. Only reason I said I did this podcast because of Kurt mm-hmm. and Karen Civil. Because she'd be on me like, yo, you got to stop that. You used a lot to go on. And, and, you know, it's times that people tell me, like, you've you done so much in the music game, but people just don't know. You know what I mean? Because I'm just not, you know what I mean? I always say I want the money. You can have the fame. Right. You know what I mean? I, give me give me all the money, <laughs> and you can have all that fame. And people, and even with, like, when I was on Family Hustle, I kind of shied away from being on, the season as it went on because the attention that I got, though it was good attention, I come from a street background, right? And sometimes when people approach me, I didn't know what their intentions were. Like I may be, I go to my son's game and people walk up to me, hey, you snake. Now in the street, I'm like, shit, like, I mean, what's up? You know what I mean? But all they wanted was a picture. Then I felt uncomfortable because I'm like, I'm not famous. You know what I'm saying? That's how I felt. But when you see this show that's on a major network and it think repeats so. all the time, yeah. people think so. So I was kind of uncomfortable with that. If I'm in the airport and people, people want to take pictures, I kind of feel uncomfortable because that's not in my DNA mm-hmm. for the fame. Thanks. But um, it's it's cool to know that people can hear your story, though. I think that, you know, you have a story to tell coming from, you know, this kind of falling on your lap, essentially working with the Mike Tyson to working with the Young Thug, you yeah. know what I mean? Um, and even, you know, shoot, Trillville, the game, we kind of didn't really touch on, but these are major artists who've seen great success because of somebody like you being on their team. You know, obviously the talent and things like that, but somebody was moving behind the scenes. So that's why it's important that, you know, your story is told so that your kids and yeah. their kids can hear this forever. So yeah. I appreciate you. I know, I appreciate opening you. Opening up right. to yeah, us. That's all good. Um, so let me ask you this, though, because I did see something about uh, you were describing two people on your timeline. I can't remember who they were, but you basically were talking about being professional and how these two gentlemen are professional. 
like, I don't know what they do exactly. I was just kind of reading the caption. Mm -hmm. Um, But that was something you stressed. And what does it mean to you, like, why is that important in this business? Like, being professional and being about your your business. Because even outside of this business, you know, in any business, you have to be professional and about your business. Um, Some, like, it's just like when I'm out with my clients or whatever, I don't, I don't bring women around when I'm, you know what I mean? That's my job. That's my business. That's being professional. Mm -hmm. When I go to meetings, I don't, unless it's my assistant or, which is Aya or Aisha, which is the product manager, Mm -hmm. that's it. You know what I mean? Or Amina or Wiedemann. You got to keep it professional. You know what I mean? Sometimes people in your life feel like they're being left out, but that's not the case. I try to make it so if you need tickets, you get tickets. I put you in a certain section, that kind of stuff. But professionalism is a key part of growth. You know what I mean? I like um, when was, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, I I went to the ESPYS for the first time because I, I had Melvin and and Jalen, mm-hmm. and that would be dope to maybe have some of my family or people I care about to come to that. But I'm still working. Right. It's for them. Right. It wasn't for me. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was for me on the business aspect because people were like, who the fuck is this? How the fuck he? I thought he did this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now he's, for my business and my brand, it was perfect. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But keeping it professional, and I always say this, to be successful is a lonely process. And I tell tell my son that, I just tell my players that, if you want to be great at something, it's a lonely process. Because guess what? Dr. King couldn't do things that other kids his age did and other people. Malcolm X couldn't do, you know what I mean? Michael Jordan. I mean, I can go on and on. Mm-hmm. People that has become successful and great, in order for them to gain their success, it was probably, and I know it was a lonely process because you don't go out when other people go out. I always tell people that I care about this. Sacrifice a good time now for a great time later. Exactly. Meaning that, you got plenty of time to go party and hang out. And uh, if you know you got to get up and go to the office or go to work, that's being professional. Mm-hmm. Not being professional is you're going to go hang out to 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, but then you're going to bitch and complain you gotta when you got to get up. And then you're going to be late. So professionalism is a, is a tremendous part of being successful. Absolutely. Do you think you've reached a, a level of success? To be honest, now I do. I do. Um in my opinion, um, financially wise, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. When it, if you measure finance by success, okay. from where I came from to now, most definitely. Yeah. But things take time. Right. And as you grow, the finance will come because you gotta think my taste is different. Mm-hmm. Other people may the kind of money I make. Other people may be like, shit, man, it. I'm good. Yeah. For me, it ain't, I'm not happy. Mm-hmm. I want more. And for a person to say money, everything, fuck that. They just ain't had enough of it. Or they ain't been around enough of it. Mm-hmm. Or they ain't seen the type of motherfuckers that had it. I don't want to hear that shit. You <laughs> know what I mean? What uh, Do you measure success by finances? I don't measure it by, I don't measure success by finance. I measure success is what it is. And business-wise, in the moves that I've made and where I've come from, and coming from the upbringing that I had and having very little and my mom making do, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It was mm-hmm. times we have no lights and she would burn candles and she had a little camping store where we, she boiled water so we can bathe and brush our teeth. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I to now, that's success. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I just did a book a book deal. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's six, for your book. That's for my book like um Leo Sullivan mm-hmm. that he has a really big publishing company if you research him. He was actually locked up with my homeboy. He was doing a 20 year federal fed really? bid. I never knew him. He was locked up in the federal penitentiary. My homeboy would always call me and I would always accept the calls. And so I think they were sharing the same cell phone or some shit. So sometimes when I would call to just check on my man, he would answer. Mm-hmm. So we developed a relationship. 
So he would tell me, man, I write books, novels. And I'm like, man, I mean, first of all, I ain't, I ain't reading a lot of books and shit anyway. I mean, now the internet, you online all the time. So come to find out, he wrote a New York bestseller. And so when he was getting out of prison, he had to go to a halfway house. So he would always say, yo, I just did a real big venture with my publishing company. And now you go on Amazon and this dude like selling books, like, some for real shit. Like yeah. he like making millions off of books. Yeah, I saw that. But he still had to go through the process of being released. He had to go to a halfway house. So one day um, I was in Tallahassee and he was in a halfway house in Tallahassee. So I said, yo, come on out. You go to the show. And I actually met him in person and I took him backstage, et cetera, et cetera. And he was like, yo, man, I ain't gonna never forget this. He's like, man, you ought to write a book. I'm like, I mean, I haven't done nothing yet. Yeah. Like I ain't, I don't have no bar like autobiography or whatever you call it to write. I mean I ain't done shit yet. I'm still living. Mm -hmm. So um, fast forward, um, he calls me like last month or two months ago or something. He's like, "Yo, I want to give you a hundred thousand dollars. I want to invest in your management company. I just want to give you a hundred thousand. Yeah, how do I get it back?" I'm like, "Well, I don't feel comfortable at this time." I'm still negotiating my deal with Rock Nation and Universal Music. So I'm like, I don't want to take your money. Like, you know, it ain't what you think it is. Like, this shit is hard. You might not never get it back. Exactly. I'd rather risk my own capital. I don't want to take nobody else's. Right. So he goes back and calls me, and him and his wife get on the phone and talk to me, right? So he, because I didn't know he's married. He got married, had a daughter. So he ended up coming in the office and um, he said, Yo, I told my wife, that I try to give you a hundred thousand, you wouldn't take it. And I got people that call me for ten thousand, five thousand a dollar every day, asking for money. I said, nah, it, it's you know what I mean. I, it ain't like that with me. He's like, yo, I want you to do a book. And I went on to tell him like, I don't think I've done enough. He said, no, nah, it's about where you come from and how you got to this point. And as you grow, we can do another one. Right. We'll do a one off. I give you a bonus. It's non recoupable. You keep the money. You know what I mean? I just want to do it. And he said. You don't understand what you did for me when I was in prison. He said, you didn't know me from a can of paint, but you answered the phone. And when I got out at the halfway house, in, into the halfway house, even though I had so much going on, he said, and so much upside, I was damn near institutionalized. He said, I contemplated on blowing my brains out. He said, I contemplated on killing myself, but you called and told me to come to this show. He said, and that's something that I never forget in my life. And whatever you need, I'll do it for you. Wow. So to me, that's a success story for me. Absolutely. That has nothing to do with finance. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so in that part, I'm learning how to be an author. You know what I mean? That's amazing. So That's a great, great, great story. Shout out to him too. For, yeah, yeah. And he, you he's being so, there at the right yeah, time. Yeah, super dope. That's dope. Dang. I lost my train of thought. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, well, when can we expect the book? Um, <laughs> soon as he finish it. You know what? <laughs> it's crazy, right? I'm trying to write this fucking book, right? <laughs> so I got my laptop. I'm, I go to the office, and I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm on the plane. I'm going to write and this, that, and the third and shit. And I'm trying to be this fucking um, novelist. <laughs> and I send him, like, the first, like, paragraph or whatever it is. Like, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm excited. He's like, yo. You don't got to worry about trying to word it and make it seem, oh, I got writers, we going to make it, I just need to know your thoughts and your this and the third. And I'm like, yo, man, like, try to focus on fucking typing and writing. It ain't as easy as people think it is. Right, it's So they came up with this solution, with this program, to where he'll come in and to my office, and he'll just record me. And we talk. So it's crazy because when doing we talking and recording, then, like, Clay will call, and he'll, we'll tell stories on the days, like, with Tip and right, this, that. Right. And then my god brother will call because he still is the security for Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson is still my homie to this day because Mike Tyson is Muslim as well. Oh. And so he's, like, my big homie to this day. So we would talk about certain things. And it's so much freely for me to get the, the information across. And then they're going to take it, and I get to proof it, but they're going to turn it into words. That's crazy. So... The, the being an author, I, I thought it was like, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to be typing, and that shit hard, man. <laughs> and that, Shout like, out to the authors out there that's yeah, really that out here typing their books. So. Yeah, like if you ain't know, if that ain't what you do, 
That shit hard. I and agree. trying to make it sound good and mm-hmm. and trying. It's like I tell people when we text. Listen, pick up the phone and call me. I'm old school because sometimes your texts don't come across on mm-hmm. how you thinking. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, that's pick that's up a the fun, phone and call you. Process, yeah. So tell me about Atlanta influences everything. Obviously, it's a brand. But what does that mean to you, being from um, Atlanta? My homeboy Grim was like, "Yo, I got I got some hoodies for you, and mm-hmm. you know, and then Gucci had one on, mm-hmm. and um, I put one on. I put it on my Instagram. It's like people went crazy, right? Right? For me, Atlanta influenced everything for me, not just music, because you'll get in debate about that. Because people say, "Oh, New York started in Bronx and started yeah, yeah. in whatever, <laughs> whatever." But for me. Everything in my life was influenced by Atlanta, and Atlanta meaning the Metro Atlanta, because Atlanta is this is the capital, but the Metro Atlanta is where you get, you know, culture. what I mean the culture, mm-hmm. right? And if it wasn't for those influences and like, man, I was growing up, it was third world music stores, right, where they sold CDs, not CDs, but tapes and vinyl, incense. Crack pipes, weed pipes. You know what I mean? Third world. If, if you do your history on third world music, but Edward J. Music tapes, mm-hmm. Edward J. on Candler Road, mm-hmm. Candler Road Flea Market, 285 Flea Market. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those spots. It, that, you know what I mean? Sharon Showcase, Club Mirage, The Libra, the one that was on Columbia Drive. You know? Um, Club Excess. You old Atlanta. You original Five, Atlanta. five, nine, seven, thirty-one, <laughs> two, ninety-one. That's all that, that over there on Camerton Road. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We influence a slang. You know what I mean? Remember when I first seen Goody Mob perform when I went to school at Fort Valley State? Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Watched them perform when they was, nobody really knew who they were. Mm-hmm. Outcast. You know what I'm saying? Remembering when like L. Cool J and the Houdini shit, like, but the music was in at in Atlanta, like playing it. You know what I'm saying? And then like food, you know what I'm saying? Like everything. So Atlanta, man, everything that I do, and, and everything that I instilled in my kids and try to instill in my business, it influenced. The influence came from Atlanta. So that's what's up. You went to school. You went to Fort Valley State. Yeah, I tried because I I wanted to go play ball. That's crazy because. My mom literally, and she'll tell you this, I wasn't trying to go to school. Now, I went to high school, and I hustled, and I did on the side, and my mom knew what I was doing, but I went to school because she, she, I knew she she wanted me to go. Right. You know what I mean? Like high school, I, I never, now, I could have been more, but you, you got to think in that era, man, counselors didn't give a shit about you, and probably half the public schools, the counselors don't give a shit about you now. You know what I mean? So when I graduated, my basketball coach had a coach at Fort Valley that used to play for him. So he encouraged me to go. He's like, yo, go. You can even be a walk-on. You can, you'll earn a scholarship. But I wasn't trying to go. My mom actually packed my shit up <laughs> and came to the, to the projects out in Lothonia, these projects. Mm-hmm. I still had crack on me. I had to get my home on my crack. Like, look, just sell it. She picked me up and was crying and told me to get in the car. And she drove me from the trap all the way to Fort, to Fort Valley. Valley. Wow. And I tried it. But Fort Valley at that time was so country and so small. Mm-hmm. Like, And for me, I come from Atlanta. I come from a, a metropolis. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't, it's just something that I couldn't just, to not be able to go where I wanted to go, not go to the mall. I'm broke. You know what I mean? And then plus my mom was going through things because my dad was still in the house, sucking from the household. Um, he, wa- he was in the house when it was convenient. Right. right. So I would know she was going through that. And I tried it. I can say I tried it. <laughs> um, but it it, it, it just, it that, one, for that one for me. I mean, you still made much of I lasted like a quarter. Qu- I lasted to Christmas. You did? Christmas break. <laughs> so you literally went for one semester. Yeah, because my coach, he asked me, Coach Michael Moore, he said, he said, this is what you want to do? You want to leave? And I'm like, yeah. I want Because I never forget. 
my cousin, he was, he went with me to school because he was going to Fort Valley. Mm -hmm. So that was another reason that she was like, like yeah. yeah. So we was in weight training or something, and I was just so depressed and shit. And w one of the older players, I think he was a senior or some shit, he was a guard, but he just kept pushing. You know, they push freshmen and shit. Mm -hmm. And I went like, I, I, I went with... I just snapped, man. I just, I, I, I literally beat the shit out of that dude. And I ran into the dorm, the athletic dorm, and I was hiding. And the coach was coming, knocking on the door. Snake, what? He was looking for me. And then when he found me, I was hiding in the bathroom. And when he found me, he was like, yo, what's going on? I like, I just want to go home. Dang. Like, because I was just so over it. over it. Like, you know what I mean? In, in, in hindsight, sometimes I wish I would have probably tried to stick it out because I'm older now. Mm -hmm. But... I tried it, and I always tell people, I always try. If it don't work, it just don't work. Right. You know what I mean? But I say have an intention in going to college on what you want to do. Right. Don't go because your parents want you to go or you feel like that's the next step out of high school because you're wasting a lot of time and money. Right. Because when you're going to school, your own self-motivation and your own – self-drive is going to dictate what you're going to become in life anyway. Exactly. So. That's true. I tried. <laughs> he said, I tried. Well, I respect that. And um, you also are really instilling that in your children. So I'm sure that they'll yeah. be be good and, and successful when it comes to their education. Because it is important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any last, like, words of advice to, like, I wanted to actually get a story out of you, but I couldn't figure out who. Um, because all the artists you work with are just like obviously some pivotal or like really uh, markers in the industry. Ti to Gucci, the game even I didn't I didn't even really know that. Um, to more recently Thug, um, but I think you know that'll come as as time goes on. We'll understand like you were behind some of these moments. Yeah, you yeah. What, what's your relationship with Patchwork? That's a, a good. Oh man, Curtis man and um. Big Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Bob so, mm -hmm. um, we used to come and record here a lot, mm -hmm. even before the big room was was um, completed. And um, just always kept a good relationship with Curtis and Bob Whitfield. Yeah. And um, it just. Why Patrick? Um, professionalism, um, consistency. The things you look for. Yeah. That's what's up. So let me ask you, for those, somebody that's listening who wants to be their own boss, who wants to, you know, be impactful in the in the business, or maybe an independent artist who's like, you know, I'm tired of doing this on my own. I don't know if I can do it anymore. What would you tell that person? Um, you got to be honest with yourself. I mean, everybody's road won't be your road. Sure. Everybody can't be Chance the Rapper because you don't know what Chance the Rapper had behind him to stay independent. True. Everybody can't be Dolph. You don't know what Dolph spent over a period of time to like be okay. independent. Mm -hmm. Times change. Then you got to be honest with yourself. See, this is the thing. People like to say, I mean, I believe it. Be great. Never give up on you. But you got to be realistic. Everybody can't dance. Everybody can't rap. Right. I mean, you're not. Some people not good at it. Mm -hmm. Some people not good singers. Some people not good baseball players, basketball players, etc. At some point, you got to be honest with yourself. The problem is the people that you have around you are not honest with you. Yes, man. Yes, man. And I'm not saying give up on yourself, but you got to be honest with yourself. Listen, I can't hold a note. I don't know what I could do when I was a kid singing in the choir. <laughs> but as now, as a grown man, I can't hold a note. I can't rap. My basketball days are over. So is it insanity for me to keep trying to do those things? Right. Or is it me being honest with myself to say, I can't, now let me find something that I am good at. Right. That's the key. Great advice. <laughs> Great words of wisdom, Snake. We Gucci. We Gucci, I think. Yeah, that was a great conversation, especially because, like I said, you're really hard to find on the Internet. I'm hoping that I can read your book and find out even more about yeah. you when that comes out and that's available for us. What you got up next? What's, like, what's, what's happening for you? Um, Just really just focusing on this situation with, that I got with Rock Nation. Right. 
Um, and congrats the, again on that. Appreciate it. Um, the, and me and Amina got some different deals that we're doing and um, some of the artists and the product that I'm putting out. And um, just trying to get things, as I say, consistent. You Absolutely. know what I mean? Absolutely. Sometimes you can put a little bit, you can spread yourself too thin and things don't get done. And we're going to take a trip in 2019. Yeah, for yourself. yeah, I re- I want I forgot I want to take a trip, man. Like, Where you gonna just, go? I don't know. Like, it's like, then I'm so fucking picky, right? <laughs> it's like I don't want to go to the Caribbean during the summertime because of hurricanes, right? You know what I mean? But but then yeah. I I'd rather go during the fall and winter months. But those are like busy months. Touring, yeah. touring. So I'd be like, I want to go somewhere that's tropical but close, mm-hmm. like Cabo or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to go nowhere too, too too far. You know what I mean? Well, start writing it down, yeah, putting it into up. place. Start you got up. some months to plan, um, and I wish you much success uh, with your new ventures, uh, with your business, and so on and so forth. And thank you for sitting down with no, me. I appreciate y'all for having me. I really do. All right, so last but not least, they got to follow this popping IG. So tell them where they can find you on social media. Um, ATL Snake at IG. And my Twitter I think it's ATL Snake One. I think I don't even use Twitter. <laughs> don't even use and it. Snapchat. I don't even <laughs> fuck with Snapchat. But ATL Snake is, is cool. that's where you can find them on Instagram. And as always, thank y'all for tuning in. Uh, you can find the podcast at IDM Podcast on social media, as well as myself at Sammy Approved. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Excellent. Peace. Right. Sonically, Sabir.